Hey everybody, Michael Snyder here, Enso Weather Watch. Tonight we are going to take a look at the El Nino Southern Oscillation. We're talking El Nino, La Nina, and neutral conditions here. Enso is one of the most important climate phenomena on the planet Earth due to its ability to change the global atmospheric circulation, and this can affect temperature and precipitation across the globe. We'll take a look specifically on how it affects the Pacific Northwest and the state of California. Now, taking a look here, back in 1998 here, when we had the Godzilla El Nino out there, it's pretty popular in the media there, and they put this skit out on Saturday Night Live. Check it out if you get the chance here. Pretty funny skit out there, and I know a lot of people bring this up whenever I talk about this when I was training for Alaska Airlines. Now, taking a look here, how did it get its name? South American fishermen noticed the warm-up of coastal waters as they occurred every so often around Christmas. They referred to the warming as El Nino for being a Spanish for boy child in connection with Christmas out there. And then as we uh, discovered the alternate cooling phase across the Central Pacific, we named that La Nina and the anchovy. I put a picture of it down there because that's a prime fishing area off the coast of Peru there. And during La Nina conditions, the fishing is really good. El Nino, not so good with the warming of that water. Now, taking a look at El Nino, the trade winds tend to be weaker here across the surface of the Pacific Ocean here. And this, you can imagine, would be New Guinea here, South America up there. And you get the warming that kind of infiltrates the Central Pacific Ocean there. Now, this would be neutral or La Nina conditions, stronger trade winds, water heated by the sun, pushed towards the Western Pacific there. And that creates a stronger gradient off the West Coast of Asia there. And it changes the jet stream pattern as it moves across the Pacific Ocean coming there. And as the trade winds pull across the Pacific Ocean, you get more upwelling here on the coast of South America, bringing up that colder water and the better fishing out there off the coast of Peru. Here we're looking at what is known as the Pacific Walker Circulation or the Walker Circulation here. This would be for neutral conditions. This is fairly similar to La Nina where the main convection hangs out across the Western Pacific Ocean here. Stronger jet stream out there. More of a variable jet stream across the Pacific Northwest and towards the West Coast of North America here. If we take a look at La Nina conditions, you see similar where the convection is there, but you've got colder than normal water here as well. And this just kind of enhances the amount of warm water that's brought westbound here with the stronger trade winds. And then again, you get that upwelling here off the coast of South America there as well. And again, this leads to a strong jet stream off of the coast of Asia there. And then you get downstream ridging and then variable jet stream bringing colder than normal conditions for the Pacific Northwest. But with that northwesterly flow and the jet stream there, it can bring drier conditions than normal for places like California on some years. Now, taking a look at El Nino, you can see we've got the above average temperatures here across the equator. We've got the convection here in a different spot here, and this creates a different gradient, which brings a more persistent southwesterly jet stream towards the west coast of North America here. And we'll take a look at some of those effects here coming up. But right now, here's another diagram of it. This would be La Nina with the warmer water out to the western Pacific here. And you get more of a variable jet stream here. You can kind of see the ridging and troughing over the Pacific Northwest here. And during El Nino years, you get the more persistent jet stream shown there. And again, the trade winds are stronger in the La Nina conditions here versus the El Nino conditions here. There's also another diagram here on the right that kind of shows the polar jet stream and kind of more variability to it. Some ridging off the coast of North America there, wetter than normal and sometimes drier than normal on average across a lot of places, Southwest USA, including California. Now, taking a look here, another quick look at the circulation. You see that ridging here kind of on this diagram there with the El Nino persistent jet stream into West uh, the west coast of North America there. And this would be that warmer than normal condition here across a lot of the Pacific Northwest up through BC into Alaska there as well. And wetter than normal for some years, at least on average across places like Southern California. More on that coming up. Now this is looking all the way back to July 2020 here. You can see colder than normal conditions across the equatorial Pacific. This black box is where we me uh, measure the ENSO phases in temperature here. And you can kind of see that below average temperature here on the temperature anomaly on the right. And you can see all this warm water that builds up here across the Western Pacific, especially in La Nina years. So if we click through this, we're going month by month here. Now we're into March of 2021. You can see this, uh, you know, anomalously cold conditions here across the equatorial Pacific as we go all the way on in through April 22 shown now. And we keep going and you can clearly see La Nina, you know, we've been on our third season now here and this just hung on all the way up until now, but you can kind of see it tailing off. We'll go back to uh, November here and you can see some pretty cold water across the equatorial Pacific. Starting to wane here as we get towards February, shown there. 
So now we're starting to look into the effects that the ENSO stages have on the Pacific Northwest here. A lot of my study has been around Seattle, Washington, too. I've got huge amounts of data based on La Nina, El Nino, neutral conditions here. This would be for wind. Average peak wind gust per month here, per ENSO phase. And you can see that actually El Nino would have been the windiest here, 1979 to 2023, averaging 47 mile per hour peak wind gust there during December is the highest there. And you can see neutral is less windy, for example, there. So you can get some good idea of what's coming up here based on what kind of ocean phase we are in. Now, this is looking at that El Nino December there. I just highlighted that that is the windiest month there. This is looking at fog, for example, here too. I've done all kinds of different parameters here as well. The actual, the fog, foggiest year actually tends to be El Nino here, averaging about 2.7 per month here for the entire year from 1979 to 2023 shown there. Now, taking a look here, this is actually thunderstorms. storms. Not a great signal here, but just one of the many parameters I gathered here data-wise. And actually, El Nino July is average over one a month here, which is fairly unusual here. But during neutral years, we average over a half a thunderstorm per month there, about one every two there as we go on in through the year or during you know, neutral conditions there. That would be from 1979 to 2023. Now we're looking at temperatures here, and this is where we really start to see some big differences coming up here. We've got La Nina is definitely much colder here in our historical patterns here for these ocean phases versus El Nino. Neutral's actually been closer to La Nina as well, and I kind of put these into 1950 to 2023, 72-year period there, 1979 to 2023 there. Now, if we go ahead and look at this, La Nina Decembers tend to be the coldest month from 1979 through 2023. La Nina December tends to be our coldest here. And by quite a bit, actually, you know, January is 41.6. That's over, well, you know, about 1.4 degrees difference there. Uh, neutral December is a close second, though, 40.4. Kind of an interesting thing going on there. More on the temperature thing, uh, temperatures here. Now, look at this. From 1950 to 2023... I did all the temperatures here. You can see all the averages for all the months here. If we go ahead and compare that to the temperatures from 1979 to current here, the only three months that were colder than the previous period was La Nina December's, neutral December's, and neutral February shown there. Every single other month was warmer during La Nina, El Nino, and neutral conditions versus the previous time frame from 1950 on. So definite warming trend here for the Pacific Northwest, regardless of ocean phase. Now looking at coldest and so season here, you can see October through April, of course, La Nina is the winner here, 45.2. And you can see neutral averaging 45.5 with El Nino at 47. Pretty big difference. Two degrees mean temperature is a lot when you work that out over a month period. And again, this is from 1979 to 2023 shown there. The warmest month tends to be October, um, uh, El Nino period here. And this is through October through April. These are months where we could potentially get snow at SeaTac there. But again, you can kind of see just the temperatures are quite a bit more usually for El Nino conditions here. A few exceptions here. For example, November, actually a tenth of a degree colder here. And that's probably because we tend to get kind of that southwest flow, strong atmospheric river activity during La Nina conditions there, but look at the January there, it's 1.4 warmer. And like February and March are significantly warmer during El Nino years, April also. And uh, October, just a little bit more. But you can see neutral is uh, is more pointed towards January. And actually, neutral uh, Januarys show up as a bit colder versus El Nino Januarys actually there as well. So kind of interesting variations there. And the warmest, of course, like I mentioned here, is El Nino. They're averaging 47 degrees during this time frame. Now we're looking at rainfall here. And the most interesting signal here really is probably the November here. You can see as you go on in through November, versus El Nino and neutral conditions. La Nina takes the cake by far, averaging over 7.1 inches of rain during a La Nina November shown there. The other months, some pretty big fluctuations in them, but the biggest signal is definitely November La Nina's shown there. Uh, and again, the rainiest month is a La Nina November there. Now, this is snow, the one everybody wants to talk about here. And there's some really interesting stuff going on here. If you look at the period from 1950 to 2023, a La Nina January averaged almost five inches per month. That is pretty darn incredible here for the SeaTac Airport area, 4.8 inches. And now look at the from 1979 to 2023, 1.8. That's a huge drop in the amount of snowfall we get during January's. But you look at 
February there, and we actually went up two tenths of an inch from 2.1 to 2.3. We went down in March a little bit as well. And if we check out the other months here, you can see November is actually less snowy now, and December's are actually less snowy than they were during this previous 72 year period from 1950 on. And you can see the huge discrepancy here. But look at this, but even back from this 72 year period from 1950, El Nino actually averaged 3.9 inches of snow during the month of January. And again, a humongous drop, 2.5 inch difference now from 1979 on shown there. And a bit of a drop for neutral period as well, but a little bit snowier February also in the neutral month showing up there and a noticeably less snowy March also. But another interesting thing there as well is a neutral November here is actually averages 2.3 per month, by far beating El Nino and La Nina. La Nina averages two tenths, El Nino three tenths, and neutral conditions. If you like November snowstorms, it is good to be in a neutral condition because a definite signal is there for that. And it's actually an increase on the previous 72 year period there as well. Now taking a look here, so the, now the snowiest month tends to be a La Nina December. That's from 1979 on. And it actually kind of played true here this year as well as we had, uh, I think, what, six days of measurable snowfall, if I'm not uh, mistaken there. But you can see on the seven months that we could potentially see snowfall at SeaTac, you can see that 8.1 inches average during El Nino, uh, La Nina year, sorry, the El Nino 3.6 less than half. That is a humongous signal there, folks. You can really you know, plan um, probably a lot of stuff there. You can, you know that you're going to be in uh, less snowy conditions here when you're in those El Nino years, but look at neutral, not too bad. Also 7.6, not too far off of El, La Nina there, but El Nino in a class of its own with just much less snowfall. And here we go again, pointing that out there with this slide. And now taking a look here, this is kind of interesting as well. So you can see that during the last 42 years, this is the amount of snow that fell during these phases, La Nina, Neutral, and El Nino. You can see 134 versus 92 versus 52. Days with measurable snow, just huge differences between the La Nina years and El Nino years here. I mean, look at that 92 to 28 average snow per day that when it does snow, it does snow a little bit more in Neutral and El Nino years, but it's, you know, it's something, but it's not too much. Uh, actual months with snowfall, you can see 43 to 26 to 13 snow per month here when on the months that it does snow. So when you do get snow, sometimes during these El Nino years, like we saw in February 2019, you can still get big snowstorms. And this is total La Nina months here. So basically, this is showing how many months have been in that phase during this time period. And you can see neutral has the most with 220 shown there. And this was the previous period here, the similar map shown there. You can see, of course, La Nina dominated the same way it did generally overall on the amount of snow months you had and the actual total snowfall there as well. Now let's take a look at how this all affects California. So impacts are likely to be greater here in late winter than early winter. That's something that showed up in the study here. This one is not my study, but it goes from February, March, April. It tends to be wetter here later on in through winter. Southern California has a stronger chance of a wet conditions during El Nino conditions versus Northern California. In a case of a very strong El Nino, heavy precipitation is most likely across the entire state. More on that here in a moment. So Northern California precipitation is weakly influenced by the ENSO phases here. It's more influenced by Southern California just because you tend to get more mid-latitude cyclones moving into Washington and Oregon versus Southern California here. Now I'll show you a, a map on a little bit of better diagram on why that is there also here coming up. You can see these are Rossby waves. There's the cold air over the North Pole here and the mid-latitude cyclones form along this boundary here between this colder air and the subtropical air to the south. So you can imagine that the mid-latitude cyclones don't like to bring these uh, you know, cyclones down as far south. So they affect Northern California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia a bit more. And this is just kind of showing you Rossby waves here, and you can kind of see the upper ridges, convergence and troughing here, more stormy at this point as well. And it can kind of show the diagram of a mid-latitude cyclone there. Google that if you want to find out more or buy a nice meteorology book if you need. Now, taking a look here, 
So this is moderate to strong El Ninos here in this study. Now we're looking at moisture at the top line here. This is CAPE, convective available potential energy. And then the actual amount of precipitation here, 120 degrees west. That's about where California is. So during moderate to strong El Ninos, during February, March, and April, you had more moisture around at that point. You had more CAPE around at that point as well, which equaled more precipitation there. And I'll show you why that is here in a moment. So basically what happens is you continue on into the February, March, April period here, you tend to get warmer conditions here across the equatorial Pacific and you get a greater gradient, which tends to bring stronger signal for precipitation for a lot of central Southern California shown there. Now this is looking at a moderate to strong El Nino here, November, December, January. This is actually 200 millibars, upper level jet stream there. You can see it is abnormally strong here during November, Jan December, and January, but it's even stronger here, February, March, and April. As you can see, a pretty power-packed jet stream there north of Hawaii pointed at the west coast of North America there as well. And with that moderate to strong El Nino, these sea surface temperatures really get going here across places off to the east of Hawaii towards the west coast of North America, which can enhance that gradient and bring additional precip into Southern California. Now, this is looking at a weak El Nino here. You can see a little bit of an enhanced jet stream here, November, December, January. But when you get to February, March, April, it does pick up a bit there as well. So it can be an enhanced signal even during weak El Nino periods. But this is no guarantee that California is wetter than normal during these periods. And this kind of shows you the scatter plot here. The red is El Nino, the blue is La Nina, and the gray is neutral conditions here. So during the 82 and the 97, 98 um, El Ninos is really monster, huge El Ninos. You can see you had a pretty good um, uh, average precipitation was well above normal here in these strong El Ninos here. So when the 2015-16 El Nino rolled around, they thought California was going to be in for some huge precipitation, but it threw everybody for a loop here. You know, we have a strong signal for El Nino's bringing big rainfall, but it actually brought below normal rainfall to much of the state here. So it kind of threw a through everybody for a loop and it just kind of shows you this is just a probabilistic forecast now taking a look here you can see the 2015 el nino here on the right versus the 1997 very warm water across the equatorial pacific just that defining characteristic of El Nino conditions here. But you notice this warmer water a little bit further north actually kind of pointed the jet stream a little bit further north into the Pacific Northwest. And we got some pretty rainy periods here that usually get directed into California here. So it, it did occur as the forecasters had thought, but the storm track was actually a bit further north and most of it missed California during that season. So it kind of was something they were really looking forward to as this strong La Nina was coming on here, but then the rain actually took a bit of a northerly track towards Pacific Northwest. Now, this is what's coming up here. This was on in through January 2023. You could see as we go into September for uh, La Nina into Oh, actually going from La Nina to neutral conditions as we go through the spring here, then possibly El Nino as we go on in through September here. But we've got new data in here as of February 9th. And you can see we are now up over 60% chance of going into El Nino conditions as we get into the fall, October months there. So we could very well have another El Nino on our hands here as we go on in through fall and winter of next year here. Ending the run of the three La Ninas, as you can see, by the time we get to March, we're most likely going to be into neutral conditions. Very high probability there. But always remember, you know, this is still just a probability forecast here. You don't know for sure. You're trying to predict the future here. You got to remember that. So even La Nina still has a chance to hang around there, although a very small one. But it does look like we are moving into El Nino conditions. Now, this is looking at a diagram here. You can see this is January now, 2023. You can kind of see this warmer water starting to infiltrate here. It just reset there. Did you see that? And you can see the warmer water moving into the uh, Pacific Ocean here off the coast of South America, kind of showing that uh, change that's coming up here, folks. More on that here in a minute as well. This is sea surface temperatures here. You can see this uh, put into motion here. You can kind of see that colder than normal water here. Still across the equatorial Pacific, but it is starting to wane here. Watch that reset. There it is. Now notice all this orange that starts to build up here as we go towards the end of that loop there. So La Nina looks like it's on the way out here. Now taking a look here, we are now into negative 0.5. So we are right on the threshold of being in La Nina. If it warms up anymore, we'll be considered into neutral 
territory here. And you can kind of see the warm-up that's been going on since last summer, the gradual climb out of La Nina conditions to where we are about now. Now, this is looking from January 11th to February 8th here. There's reds. Look at all those reds across the Equatorial Pacific. That is the water warming up there as you go on in through from January into February here. So you can clearly see we are warming up across the equatorial Pacific here coming up. And now this goes back all the way to 1950. When we're in the blue here, that's La Nina conditions there. And you can see the blue line and the red line. When you're above that red line, you are in El Nino conditions there. When you're below the blue, you are in La Nina. In between that, you'll be in neutral territory. So you can see all the, the transitions, the ocean transition periods here. La Nina back to some big El Ninos here back to La Nina. Then you can see the big triple dip La Nina here in the 70s. We had another one in the late 90s towards the early 2000s. And we just went through another one here around 2020. Let's back up again there. But yeah, you can see the, also the big El Nino here, 2015 to 2016, 97 to 98 there as well. How big will the next El Nino be? You never know for sure, but you know we'll be watching it closely for sure. This is looking back at the actual values here from 2022 back to 2010. And you can see that we went into La Nina conditions here as we were in last summer. Well, the summer of 2020, I should say, summer 2021, 22. You can see we went through three winter seasons here of being in La Nina conditions here across Pacific Northwest. And actually, I mean, this is an ocean phase here, but that's pretty unusual here to be in the La Nina for three straight seasons in a row. Now, this is looking at global temperatures as they are rising here, as you may or may not know. Take a look at when we get El Nino conditions. You can see the blues on the south side of this line here, and El Ninos tend to make the planet warmer than even that trending line here. So the next El Ninos are probably going to be somewhere up above the one degree mark here as, a, uh, you know, as the entire planet is starting to warm here. So now we're going to look at this. So this is the actual... This is the European seasonal here. This was initialized on February 1st here. And if we put this into motion, you well, first of all, let's look at this. Across the equatorial Pacific, you can see we still are below normal temperatures, just kind of hanging on to La Nina there. Now, this is March. Look at it wane, and you can see that warm water starting to come across the equatorial Pacific there. April, look at that. You can see that tongue just lashing out from South America across the equatorial Pacific. There's May, there's June, July. August, you can clearly see this forecast is headed towards El Nino. And there's something else we can do here as well. Let's back all the way up towards November 1st forecast here. And now let's play this one out. Clearly see La Nina being in charge there. And you can see that way, those waning conditions there as we go through April and May. So that was a forecast a few months ago there as well. So you can see the forecasts are pretty dead set on bringing us from La Nina to El Nino conditions here as we go on in through summer and fall coming up here. So we'll see how this plays out here. Another thing about La Nina here as we are, actually, let me bring this back to where we were currently before I talk about this. We are in February right now. We're still kind of hanging on to those La Nina conditions. The atmosphere doesn't like to flip like a switch. La Nina is probably going to hang on for a month or two, maybe two and a half months longer than the conditions exist. It takes a while for the atmosphere to respond to these changes here. And so it's not just going to have a flip, you know, we're not just going to flip a switch and all of a sudden during California rainier or just go right into El Nino conditions. It's going to take a while here. And this could persist in through spring for a quarter than, colder than normal here, spring here across Pacific Northwest. Another good thing about all this too is this being a La Nina year, California has been wetter than normal here. And that's a good thing. So if we can bring a wet El Nino in here, we could really do some damage to that drought across some of the West here as well. You know, something to look forward to trying to be an optimist here. So anyway, um, yeah, I hope you guys found this video useful here. I hope it explains La Nina conditions, El Nino conditions, neutral conditions, and the ENSO phases here a little bit more. So when I kind of just mention them and talk about them a little bit on my day-to-day -day videos, you'll have something to go back to and look at and try to see, you know, what I'm talking about a little bit more. But anyway, yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying these videos. I'm going to do my normal briefing tomorrow, see what that snow is looking like for some of the Pacific Northwest. We'll take a look at California as well and see how the storms are training there also. So anyway, I um, hope you guys are having a good night and I will talk to you guys later and I'll see you then.